very, it's a very um, different and, character as well. And, and also, it, it's yeah. completely... Yeah. And then this is one of the reasons why John went in the direction that he did, I think, because um, I think when I originally read the script, I'm, I was imagining somebody like Hannibal Lecter. Mm. You know, um, and um, and and John actually played him sort of uh, slightly effeminate. And it, it's one of the strengths it has that it's not a Mike Myers sort of unstoppable. But you think it's actually quite a weak character. Yeah, and and yeah. that actually draws you in quite a lot into it. That you're sort of well, this should be easy, but then it's a cycle. It's much feels much more psychological in the how he affects people, I suppose. Yeah. While yeah. the the Wolf Creek character was. This full on, the yeah. stalking. Um, I guess. Okay, and the rest of the cast. Uh, uh, Ray Raylon Chum was also involved before I got on board, and again, you know, I, I'm I'm a big fan of hers. Um, so uh, you know, the idea of being on set with Raylon Chum was like, wow, great. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, uh, the two actors that I cast were um, Daniel Harris, uh, which was a Sky casting. Right. Um, and uh, and she just seemed perfect for, for, for the part. That's and, her genre. And, and it, yeah. it, it, That's what she does. It is her genre, but I think this is the first time she's actually played a leading part. Um, and um, uh, you know, and and you know, I think actresses die for a, a role like this. Mm. And it's a bit more mature as well. She, mm. she's sort of, I suppose, she's at the age where she needs to go. I'm not the the teen. Yes. The, the, the sort of college student anymore. Yes. Yes. Be yeah. I mean, because of the size, she often plays down. Mm. Uh, but she's in her mid thirties, so she, you know, so, so she, she's, she's actually looking to be taken seriously as, yeah. as an actress and, and somebody who's not just a screen queen, yeah. and and she has the, the chops to do it too. So three weeks. So you think your your background in Brookside, as you've mentioned a couple of times, this is the key to getting through a, a three week shoot. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> that that and um, and the cast. Uh, I, I mean, the cast. Um, uh, um, Danielle would get it in one take. You know, so. Generally speaking, I've, I've had experiences where, where you have to go take after take after take to actually get what you need. Or, or uh, with John's performance, uh, for example, because um, it was very difficult to find the right kind of tone and the right mm. balance. And um, John was giving it much more than it probably needed. Um, and he was very sort of adamant that that, that was how, how it was going to be. So what I had to do is I had to bracket his, his performance and I had to do several takes. And each take I'd get him to bring it down, and down, and down. So, so he would give me what he wanted on the first take, I would get what I wanted on the seventh. Um, that doesn't mean to say that what I wanted ended up in the cut film, but um, uh, that, that was, you know, as, as a director, that's really what you have to learn to do. Um, because, you know, it's actually very difficult if an actor is not doing what you want to do and won't agree to do what you want to do, how do you manage that? Um, a lot of um, you know, you know uh, working in the industry at this level is is managing very difficult situations and at the same time getting what you want without being confrontational. Mm. Excellent. Okay, now I'm going to uh, see if we've got any questions from the audience for a moment. I don't have a handheld microphone. I normally run up, so you have to be a little loud. You there, just sir? Um, this is actually based on a book that was written in the 1980s. How close is it to the book, and what the significant difference is? It's exactly the same as the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, almost word for word. Um, I, actually, in the screenplay, that was one of the problems I had uh, because the dialogue was very ex expositional. Um, and um, uh, so I, I sort of conspired with the actors to, to rewrite all the dialogue. Um, uh, and we basically sort of, we didn't improvise on set, but we had three days of read throughs before we started shooting. And during that, we, we changed the dialogue to. to to fit the, the way the actors would say their lines. But the other thing is because the screenplay was written back in the early 90s, um, it, it was still in an analog world, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, everything just felt slightly dated, and, and uh, you know, e even the character's name, Wendy, you know, feels slightly dated. Um, uh, so we, we, we sort of fought all the way through to, to, to bring it up to something that resembled this day and age. So given what you've said about the producer, the producer wrote the script, the producer's the power behind it all, how was his reaction to the, these changes you and the cast were making? Um, well, he was on set every day, um, and um, uh, uh, often what, what would happen is, you know, he would say, oh, that's, that's changed since, you know, that's not what was written on the, on the page. I said, well, yeah, but the, act, the actor and the actress won't say it like that. 
you know, and then they would stand up and say, no, we wouldn't sit back then. And, and in, in that situation, we had control. Right. Um, uh, uh, so ge generally speaking, I think that whilst we were shooting, because uh, uh, rarely does a script, does a screenplay actually pr provide you with what you need. Mm. Often I find myself being presented with screenplays and being presented with projects that just look like a bundle of trouble. Um, and you're going to look through there and see how you can salvage the situation. It's all about troubleshooting. Um, and you identify what those problems are and you, can, you, know, you work with your cast and your crew to, to, um, to eliminate as many of them as you possibly can. Um, uh, but at the same time, there are usually other people involved in the process that, that are there to, to prevent you from doing that. And it's just, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. Any more questions? Up there. No? Oh, down the front there. Is the producer here? No. <laughs> I'd be a little more open than you might be if he was, for the sound of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, the thing is, is the producer is, um, is, is a very tenacious uh, character um, who has lived with this project through many different sort of reincarnations. It was originally going to be set up in uh, Iowa and funded through, um, through a tax break there. And I think the director that was attached to it then was Eric Red. Um, and then that fell through. Um, and uh, because the, um, uh, the, the state of Iowa uh, stopped the tax break. Um, so what Robert did um, is he moved it to Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, Lucky McKee was, uh, was going to direct it then. Um, and I think L Lucky and um, Robert couldn't see eye to eye on the script, so Lucky left, and then that's when I was brought in. I think Anthony Hickox was somewhere in the mix as well. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we were in Regina, Saskatchewan, where we dropped a 55% tax credit, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were five weeks into pre-production there. And because of the producers, there's a 30-year gap in his career, um, he couldn't get bonded. Right. Um, and um, as a result, that fell through. So we had to move the production. Well, you're all already cast and crew and everything on set. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. then we had Luke Goss actually playing the part of Casper Van Dien. <laughs> um, and uh, literally two days before, you know, the, the cast were due to arrive, it all went belly up. Um, so, uh, so we then moved to Portland, Oregon and shot it there. And so what, what was interesting about Portland was they offered a 20% tax break, which was nowhere near as attractive as Saskatchewan. But in Portland, there's no, there's no tax, there's no VAT. So actually, you, you could say that's worth 35%. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Saskatchewan has now completely pulled their tax credit, it doesn't exist anymore. So, so the film industry in Saskatchewan's dead, and everybody's moving to Manitoba. Right, there you are, there's a hint for you <laughs> out there. Question there. Would you work for the same producer again? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Too long a pause, that's a no. <laughs> I, I, I think if I had Final Cut um, and, and I had sort of uh, the final control on the screenplay before we started shooting and, uh, and I had control of the casting, um, then yes. He's actually... Uh, 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 very tenacious character who's quite capable of charming money out of anybody to make films. So. Excellent. That's Any why he invited me here, because I was meant to meet him about finance. <laughs> 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 but can you tell us a bit about the budget and finance of yeah. this one in a bit more detail? How, you raise it? How much access did you have, knowledge did you have to that side of things? Um, I saw it all, yeah, uh, probably not all of it, but uh, uh, this was financed um, by a consortium. Of, so a lot of company uh, names. Private up, investors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that was more product placement. I don't think the money came from product placement. It was more sort of payment in time. Right. Like free flights from LA to Canada, free flights for John from Australia. To there was a few beer close-ups. I noticed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was McCormick and Schmidt. I mean, that was a location that we used, right. and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, but uh, uh, Robert had managed to gather together a consortium of private investors, and um, uh, some of them were his personal friends. I mean, for example, Brad Harris, mm -hmm. um, who's um, in the film as the captain, 
Um, he, he was an investor and an executive producer. Um, uh, there were probably about eight or nine individuals who were putting money in. You mentioned Brett Harris, so a police captain who says I'm that far to retirement and doesn't die in the film. <laughs> which I was quite surprised by. <laughs> well done on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what was the budget? Sorry. Do you know the total budget? Uh, yeah, the budget um, was $1.6 million. Dollars. And that includes the, 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 the tax breaks. And I'll ask the other question that filmmakers generally ask here. What was it shot on? Shot on a red. A red. Yeah, although there were some, some scenes, particularly scenes in... Well, actually... Uh, a lot of the scenes in cars were shot with 5Ds right. because they're small enough yeah. and, and, and compact to be able to sort of manage in, in that situation without getting low loaders or side mounts or bottom mounts because um, we just didn't have the time um, to, um, to, uh, to rig all of that kind of equipment. Um, and uh, you'll probably notice that there are lots of sort of um, flashbacks throughout the film um, which I didn't shoot. Um, the producer shot them on a 5D and put them into the film, so they, that, that's 5D as well. So was it, you say he put them into the film, so when, the final day of shooting, was that you done? I yeah. mean, how much, well, no, I, I, the editing I, and the post-production, I, I, I assembled the film, I put, I put it together um, as best I could, um, and, uh, and then that was it. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, any more questions? I think this is a, actually a very interesting look into a different side of the independent director. So I'm very glad to have you along. So Julian Richards. Thank you. Thank you.